Hello, everyone, and welcome into the first of a series of roundtable discussions that we're having here at Big Ten Network. And these discussions are involving the social and racial awareness, the awakening, I guess you could say, that's going on in the country around us, but also on our specific campuses. I'm Coley Harvey, the host of this panel, and I've got three student athletes, three Big Ten student athletes who are here to, to talk with me about some of these conversations that we've been having. And uh, let me go on and quickly introduce them to you. We've got Jared Florell, a senior wrestler at Purdue. And uh, Jared is actually from the Minneapolis area. We will certainly be talking about the, uh, the killing of George Floyd and how that kind of kicked off everything this summer. Next joining us, we have Nas Hillman, a uh, junior forward on the Michigan women's basketball team. And uh, Nas has really used her voice this summer to, uh, to step up and be a presence on campus as a leader in that regard. And also we've got Julius Brents and Julius is a third year defensive back on the Iowa football team. Of course, Iowa has gone through uh, its share of change, let's say, uh, this summer, given what we're talking about. So with all that, let's begin. And, you know, guys, the biggest thing I want to start off by saying is that this isn't really story time. You know, we've all kind of shared our, our individual stories of discrimination and prejudice that we've probably encountered or gone through this summer and this fall. This is more about moving forward. What comes next? What is the change that we want to see? To that end, I actually do want to begin a little bit with story time. And I want to start off with you, Jared. As I mentioned, you're from the Minneapolis area. Where were you when you first heard about George Floyd's killing? And just kind of what were your initial reactions to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was actually here on Purdue's campus. Um, I'm in my apartment on West Lafayette. So I got the news. One of my friends um, who's living in the area hit me up. He just told me to go look on Twitter. Um, you know, went on, saw the video that everyone's seen. Um, I actually wasn't able to get through the whole video uh, just due to the graphic nature of it, and, you know, being so close to home. Um, so I remember very vividly. And then, you know, for the next four weeks, obviously that was about the only thing on anyone's feed, timeline, anything anyone was talking about. Um, it, was, it was difficult for me seeing, you know, so much pain, you know, not only within the black community and, you know, our larger uh, community, you know, within Minnesota, um, you know, just being so close to, to home um, and seeing like the streets that, you know, I, I visited growing up, you know, community that I've been a part of, um, you know, hurting so much from that. So, yeah, it was it was a really difficult time, but, um, you know, I, as bad as it is, I'm glad that you know, some conversation and some actionable items have been coming out of, you know, the tragedy that was, you know, George Floyd's death. Now, I should point out it was uh, May 27th when that occurred, and it was in the days that followed that we began to see some of this awakening, I guess you could say, around the country. Uh, Nas, uh, quickly, where where were you when you uh, first heard that news, and uh, and how, uh, how did you uh, perceive it right away? Yes. Um, so I was actually at home. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio was home for me. And one of my best friends actually sent me the video, um, I believe, via Instagram. Um, and a lot like Jared, very tough to, to get through. Um, heartbreaking, honestly, as if I've known George Floyd my entire life. Um, just really <laughs> caught me to my core and it, it awoke something in me that, you know, said that something has to change. And from then on, I, I think I watched the news about just about every day, all day, um, because that was what was running across the TV screen, and and that was what I felt was important at that moment to educate myself about, you know, the circumstances that were going on, and and just kind of trying to be caught up in the news. So I was I was at home, and and it really hit me. Uh, Julius, uh, just same question, really quickly. What uh, what what did you perceive at that time, and where were you? Yeah, so I remember when it happened. Uh, I happened to be here in Iowa City. Um, I just remember, just like everybody else, I just found the VIA um, Twitter and everything, and like they all said, like Nas, uh, Jerry said, it was it was pretty heartbreaking. Like I kind of viewed it as like that could have been me, family members, like it was just like me, black African American males. Uh, so you know, it just kind of hit hard, and I just remember like when all the awakening stuff happened. I remember me and teammates just going out protesting trying to have those uncomfortable conversations with our teammates who may not look like us, just to uh, create more awareness and uh, just bring it to light more. Cause like I said, yeah, it hit pretty hard. It was pretty heartbreaking. 
uh, speaking of some of those conversations and even the protests and demonstrations peacefully that have taken on uh, within some of our college towns, uh, now, as I know that this has been something that has really awakened something within you, uh, I'm curious to know what what has kind of bubbled up inside of you to to, to be even more vocal on campus, and uh, yeah, just kind of walk me through some of those demonstrations uh, that you guys have had in Ann Arbor as well. So I've always um, been able to have these conversations with my best friends or my or my family members, um, but at that moment, I decided. After seeing that video, I decided that it's it's I can reach a much bigger platform and a group of people if I decide to step out of my comfort zone, comfort zone and have those conversations with people who don't look like me, the people on my team, or the people who follow me on, on social media. I say it so often that student athletes have such a big platform and opportunity to reach so many people that we should do just that. Um, so as I found this rage, I, I would say, that, that built inside of me. I was able to have those conversations with my teammates and they have been asking a lot of questions that I appreciate because I feel like so often during this time we're saying, I don't know, I don't understand. And I'm trying to help as often as I can help them understand and help them to know so they don't make some of the same mistakes that have been going on in the past. Um, so I know some of the demonstrations at home, I attended a couple of uh, protests um, in Cleveland and then there was also protests here in uh, Michigan on campus um, that actually our football team in Eastern Michigan um, prepared and got a, a great numbers to come out. And um, a couple of us were able to speak. I was a part of that. Um, and then also with being on the Big Ten um, anti-hate, anti-racism uh, coalition, I feel that that's another opportunity for me to speak out and to educate myself as well as others. Um, I, I keep talking about educate, educate, and that's actually the subcommittee that I'm on um, in the coalition, because I just think that the first steps to making change is to educate our and each other. Um, and, th and those are the first steps that I'm taking at this point. I should mention that all three of you guys are on the anti-hate, anti-racism coalition as well, and that's important. Uh, going back to you really quickly, Julius, uh, you mentioned the uncomfortable conversation uh, conversations that you've had. Nas also just referenced those. What have they been like? Uh, take, take me through some of those conversations that you've had with teammates. Uh, it's mainly, like I said, being with teammates. Um, like what Nas said, just, just having them uh, just reach out to me, asking me questions, uh, just trying to give them like a little bit of my background, uh, just a little bit of understanding. So like, just guys simply just me, I actually just reaching out to them as well, just to uh, get their viewpoints and just have like different conversations. So just again, being more comfortable with being uncomfortable. But like, there won't be a change if you won't have these type of conversations. So it actually has been like a pretty, pretty good uh, impact on it and good turnout, so continue to move in the right direction is things that can make a change. So. Yeah, that's one of my favorite sayings, being being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think you're doing a, a good job with that. Uh, Jared, I, I wanna ask you about student leadership. What does it look like and why is it important for student leaders to be able to have the impact on change that we all kind of wanna see going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, Nas touched on this earlier um, specifically being a student athlete we have platforms that you know a lot of students or just college age young uh, adults don't have um, and i think it's you know vitally important to use those platforms to, to spread messages that we feel like is important um, and just you know being a student leader you know specifically on our campus is is um I think vitally important to the progress that we want to see some of these action items like more representation more inclusion on our campus is, is important because if you know students aren't willing to kind of voice the concerns or you know share their experiences with administrators coaches or whoever has that power to make a change then you know they they won't know um you know what is really going on in the life of students you know what would be most impactful um so i think you know our student leaders on our campus have done a great job of organizing over this past three months coming together and really talking about you know experiences that have not been great on our campus and you know what we'd like to see change and then you know moving together as a unit um, to kind of bring some of these issues to light to the administration um, similar to Nas at um, Michigan organizing protests um, and just trying to get the ear of you know everyone within our community now that you know that everything is kind of bubbled over and we're kind of at this tipping point what are some of those changes that you guys would like to see jared uh, when it comes to uh, to the student leadership at purdue 
yeah, I think, you know, some of the biggest ones um, is representation, uh, you know, representation within leadership positions, both within the university and within athletics, um, as well as within uh, mental health resources on our campus. Uh, I know mental health has been a hot topic within higher ed for a number of years, and um, sometimes it's hard um, just lim due to the limited amount of resources for people to get adequate mental health, but also, you know, there's you know, more nuances that go along with that being a young black student. Um, and I think having representation in those offices is extremely important as well as just having more um, professors and staff members of underrepresented minority communities. So, you know, students that look like myself can go see a professor that looks like me and, and you know, see the potential that, you know, I have as a young black man. Um, I think those are some things that um, have been most impactful for me when I'm um, seeing someone of leadership or a leadership position, a young black man, seeing someone like that that looks like me has been really impactful and something that, you know, I think is a big, um, a big goal of ours is to increase representation in that space. Yeah, that's very important. And actually, at uh, Iowa, we've seen some of that even this summer uh, without necessarily right this minute getting into some of what happened at Iowa. I, I will uh, point out that uh, Broderick Benz, a former Hawkeye, uh, was recently uh, named the uh, Executive Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Iowa. And I guess we will get into a little bit of, of what has transpired this summer. Uh, of course, you have former players, former student athletes were really making their voices heard uh, coming out saying uh, that they felt the culture of their program uh, was off uh, at, uh, at the University of Iowa. And so, Julius, uh, to that point, you're a current player, a current student athlete at Iowa. What was it like through June and July as you were hearing these things said, maybe experiencing certain things yourself within, uh, within the university? Uh, what, what was all of that like? Take us to that moment. Um, so yeah, like as we all know, we had some changes that took part here at the University of Iowa, and it just goes back to like um, just like the leadership and uh, just like different type of conversations we had, and a lot of guys like getting feedback. A lot of guys just weren't comfortable even having those type of you know conversations with coaches or whoever it may be that was in the role of leadership. So just having those guys who passed. Uh, former athletes who have came to the university speaking up and kind of giving us that type of platform to, you know, be, uh, become comfortable just having those type of conversations. Uh, it's kind of made like a like a culture change here at the University of Iowa. I can say that we're moving in the right direction. Um, won't get too much into details, but it definitely has been a lot of a lot of difference uh, took place here. Yeah, one of the changes that did take place was the strength coach, uh, Chris Doyle, of course, uh, departing the university amicably, uh, both sides agreeing to that with a settlement. Um, but I, I do want to want to ask you, you know, take us into the program just a little bit, Julius. I know there's certain things you can't necessarily say right now, but but what has change looked like? I, I know that Coach Ferentz uh, has said that he wants to uh, have all of his coaches basically, quote, really listen in a different way to you guys to his players and he also is kind of vowed for change to come I, i'm just curious have we seen some of that change uh to this point w what have you all been able to uh, to accomplish so far yeah so prior to that happening it seemed like it was in a sense kind of like a disconnection between players uh you know my ethnicity uh in the university of iowa now it seems like uh, guys are more comfortable you know communicating with coaches, uh, those in uh, the world leadership. You know, like you said, with Roger Benz now having this new position, you know, just having our voices heard now. It's, um, it definitely has been like a culture change with that in that instance. So, uh, you know, guys are a lot more comfortable just having, like I said earlier, these uncomfortable conversations and uh, uh, ways to make a uh, change here at the University of Iowa. You know, um, one of the uh, uncomfortable conversations, uh, I guess you could say, that we're having as a country right now is involving the general election and the uh, uh, just the elect electoral process that is coming up. Uh, Naz, I want to ask you about the importance of voting. And the reason why this is an issue, at least in my eyes right now, is because it is important to the Big Ten and it is, and it is important to Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren, who has created the voting registration initiative as part of 
the uh, the anti-hate, anti-racism coalition as well. Um, I'm just curious, why is this uh, particular moment so crucial when it comes to voting, so crucial to this change, Nas? Yeah, I would say because right now we, we want to be the change now. I feel like so often we hear we are the future, but I mean, I don't see why we, we can't be the now, we can't be the present. So going out and voting will start some of that change that we seek to see. Um, and, I, and I think that people sometimes underestimate the power in voting and how much power we do have. And that it's not just about the presidential election because that ballot it comes with more than just voting who want, who, of who is the president. And some of the people who are on that ballot can make the changes in your, in your a direct and immediate um, community. So going out and voting is, is another way that I would say that your voice is being heard. Um, and, and people often say that one vote wouldn't matter, but it does. In some of the smaller elections, I can't tell you exactly the one, but recently I found out that a vote was decided on a coin toss. That's that's one person right there that could have changed um, the outcome of you know who who would be in, in power. So I, I think that it just goes to show that our voices matter in this moment. I mean, and forever. I mean, we want to see the change um, that we seek to be and we seek to see later on and now. Um, we have to go out and use our voices um, in this election. And for me, it's my first time voting, so I'm excited. Um, a lot of people, I think, college right now, this is our first time voting, um, just because you know four years ago we were 16, 17, we weren't. Ever vote um so it's so it's important to use our voices for the first time let it be heard i mean i'm sure you guys have seen the nfl commercials where they say only 60 percent of the people eligible eligible to vote voted i mean that's that's crazy like to think about that and put that into perspective um i mean like they said imagine if you only gave 60 percent in, in in school or or on your respective field or quarter or whatever, however you play. Um, but yeah, just just to have your voice heard and, and try to be that change that you seek to see. Yeah, yeah that's right, 60%. That's a failing grade if we're, if we're using uh, uh, academics as the, uh, the, the litmus test. Um, actually, Jared, uh, to that point, I know that at Purdue, you guys recently had a, uh, I guess, a voting registration uh, uh, text uh, bank. Uh, just tell me a little more about that and how that may be taking us to some of the change that you're seeking. Yeah, so um, again, like you said, voter registration has been a huge initiative, you know, within the Big Ten, I'm sure within everyone's respective uh, campuses, uh, likewise here at Purdue. Um, so we partnered uh, with our Civic Engagement Center um, here on campus, um, and they have a ton of resources. I encourage anyone um, who may be on a Big Ten campus to see if there's anything like that. Um, they're way more knowledgeable than I am, and uh, we're able to provide us with so many resources about, around registration, uh, education, and, and just the whole process of you know getting registered to vote and making sure your ballot counts. Um, so we teamed up with the Civic Engagement um, team here, um, and then they actually they had an event. Um, I want to say it was like early last week, um, where there's this app where it basically had an automated text and you just put in a few of your friends numbers a few contact names um, and it sends out uh, this you know general text it's like hey have you registered to vote registration deadline ends um, it's October 5th in Indiana like here's a link here's what you can do um, so there's that was just like a really easy way for you know people to get involved and you know make sure that we're engaging with our our peers and encouraging everyone to register to vote, to use their, use their voice. Um, and also really easy, like didn't take a whole lot of, whole lot of effort from people. It was an easy ask, hey, just, you know, jump in on this um, and it's for a good cause. And I think, you know, being able to network within our own campus community and, and utilize resources that is already there for us um, has been super paramount and important in these steps to making change because you know, on a lot of campuses, there's already initiatives going on. Um, and, you know, as we have alluded to earlier, we just have a bigger platform than some of these, um, you know, groups on campus. So just continuing to elevate some of the awesome things that are already going on on Purdue's campus has been, you know, something that we've been able to do, I think, pretty successfully and something that, you know, we're hoping to continue to do, you know, throughout this next month leading up to the election and, you know, forward on into the future. Yeah, as of the initial airing of, uh, of this roundtable here, I will say that there are some states, to your point, that have actually now uh, finished uh, registration, voter registration. There are others within our Big Ten footprint who are still uh, having that voter registration. It is still open. So 
be sure that you check your uh, Secretary of State as well as your uh, State Election Board to figure out those details. Switching gears, you guys, um, you know, one word that we've heard a lot this summer is the word ally or allyship. And, um, you know, Julius, I guess this kind of goes along with some of the conversations that you're having on campus with your peers and even at home. What does allyship look like to you? And just how can it help? How can it have a positive impact? I could say one thing in particular is that change that happened with um, Roderick Benz, giving him that position, uh, you know, just to give us that type of, uh, like that voice. Cause right, like I said, like in the past prior times, I feel like we haven't really, seems like we haven't been heard or even had the position to be able to speak out on these type of topics. So just different changes within our, within our leadership, um, leadership and uh, this, I would say just overall, just, uh, I don't know, just conversations and stuff. It's just made a different impact, I would say. Uh, Naz, uh, kind of to the, to a similar point to that, um, within the coalition itself, the Anti-Hate, Anti-Racism Coalition, are you seeing some of that connection uh, within administrators as well as students where, uh, you know, people who may be allies, so to speak, are trying to really learn and trying to understand what they can do to affect change. Are you seeing that on the coalition standpoint? I, I definitely uh, do see that in, uh, from the coalition standpoint. Um, I just know every time the call, there's so many different backgrounds that are on that call who are willing to help. And at every point, they want to know what can they do? What more can they do? What can they bring back to their families or their organizations or institutions? Um, and just really trying to educate themselves on what they can do next, whether that's getting out the word about voter registration or you know what what a microaggression is and and what type of biases they have and how they can change that and and how they could forward that message to whoever they are around and and in what ways um can they just be different from some of the people who have come before them um and i think that they're really focusing on um, the true importance of this um, coalition of anti-hate and anti-racism, and and trying to take those next step for uh, next steps forward. Uh, they they want to be the change, and their I think education just keeps coming up for me, and they just really want to educate themselves, and then they can say what's next. How can I implement this into my life? How can I implement this into my schedule every single day while being conscious of it? Um, one thing that we did in our coalition is we had an am implicit bias. Um, test seminar um and in that moment i mean i even sat there and said well i have bias so i'm sure everyone else on this call um has some type of bias that they have to sit back and reflect on um and then you know implement how can i be different at this point or or my next opportunity to be different how can i do that um so really everyone's there with open ears and an open heart and open minds um trying to make that difference um at all ages it's not just the student athletes it's administration who are a part of is, who's a part of this committee um and, and they want to learn from us and they want to learn from each other um but really really trying to say you know what can i do next after i learn and educate myself and, and educating others that's uh that's actually that's all very good very very well put um you know jared uh something i want to ask you as i shift gears just a little bit more is uh is about using your voice you know we've we've talked about being a leader using your voice as a leader in that regard but why is it that you feel that that you three here as well as other students who are on this coalition and why do you feel like you guys have not shied away from using your voice this summer i can just speak for myself personally um being that you know i've always felt like it's it's been um I don't want to say a talent, but you know something that I've been comfortable doing on you know past sports teams or other clubs that I've been involved with, even like back since high school. Um, and I think you know for me it goes down to kind of the values that I hold. Um, and if I you know feel like something you know is not right or something needs to be said, um, if no one else is going to say it, like I want to make sure that it is said. Um, so so standing up in that way, and then. Um, yeah, I just feel like, um, you know, as student leaders, as student athletes, like people are, are looking for to us um, for, you know, one, an example and two, sometimes just for some reassurance or for us to say something. Um, and, you know, when, when you realize that you have that type of um, platform and, and 
persuasion. Um, I think it's it's important. It's hard to hard to not use your voice in a way that's impactful in a way that is authentic. Um, so for me, it's it's always just kind of come down to you know one if I see something that's going on that you know I don't agree with, um, just being like you know if, if this were to happen in front of someone else who knows me well um, and. I didn't say something like, how would that person feel? Like if it's a microaggression, if it's, you know, some out of line is taking place, you know, if someone that I care about was sitting right there who might fall into one of those groups and they saw me sit back and do nothing, like how are they gonna look at me? So I think that's where I kind of draw, you know, some some strength and courage to stand up and say things at times. And then now I feel like there's so much energy and um, community behind you know, this change that we're trying to have take place on our campuses as a nation, that um, it's it's a lot easier to use your voice. You know, there's there's so many people behind us right now, you know, that want to see the same change that we want to see um, and that are encouraging us to use our voice, like even within the coalition, you know, within this round table that, you know, it's, we're really blessed to be in the position to be able to kind of spread our message and spread the message of you know the greater movement so I think that makes it so much easier to really say what needs to be said yeah I would agree with you and I, I actually to that point now is it, it just this just really brought this back to me I noticed um on your uh, Twitter timeline that you have a, a pinned tweet that says you ever wonder if you'd be on the right side of history when the moment came well the moment has come that being said what side of history do you feel like you're on right now? Do you feel like you have accomplished something in a way? I definitely do feel like I've accomplished something. And if I were to say myself, I feel like I'm on the right direction to being on the right side of history. Um, I think that um, in this moment, doing something is going to be more helpful than standing to the side. And I think that you see that a lot in, ally in, in allyship. Um, you see so often, you know, the word silence is violence. And I feel no matter what skin color you are, what gender you are, what, you, what religion you believe in, in this moment, if you're silent, you're not helping the cause. And I, and I feel like by us speaking out and, and educating ourselves and each other, um, we, we're moving in the right direction because no, nothing has ever gotten done by standing still. I mean, continue, continuing to move and have conversations is, is what, gonna, what is gonna propel us to move forward. Um, so, I mean, I'm working hard to, to be on the right side of history. Hopefully when I look back in 20 years, I can say that I was on the right side of history. Um, but, but that's really what I believe right now. And, and I think that this moment has come and you know, when we look back in our history textbooks and see you know, the work, some of the work that we've done and, and just remembering these moments, I wanna say that I was a part of some type of change um, and some type of difference that allowed the people who were, are to come after me um, so they can have opportunity than I had, which I have a lot of great opportunities, but so that they have a, you know, a more cushion to seat than I do right now. Um, so that's, that's very important to me. You know, guys, I just have one more question I really want to pose to each of you. And I'm going to start with you, Julius. Where do we go from here? What is next? What 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 does next look like in Iowa City? What does next look like in Indianapolis, where you're from? What, what does next look like even around the country? What do you think? Where do we go from here? Uh, first thing I would say is if we really want to make a change, we need to get everybody out to go vote, especially our young, like our generation, younger generation, the 18 with the 36 year age is, um, you know, I feel like a lot of people just are just content with how things are. And I feel like now with the with the movement that has been created, um, like she said, like now I said, like now is the time. We need to move forward from this, um, continue to have these conversations. Um, and I would feel like just with that, things will move in the right direction. Uh, same question to you, Jared. Yeah, I'll just echo what Julius just said, you know, next thing is go out and vote encourage your friends and family to do the same um and I, you know i think something that's been you know a big topic of this conversation that you know Nas has alluded to julius has alluded to is education i think you know continuing to educate ourselves our peers um reinvest into education within our communities educating the youth is going to be so important to make sure you know we've seen so many injustices happen within our communities um going back hundreds of years now and it still feels like we're kind of stuck in this limbo 
of, you know, where, where do we go now? What, you know, what change do we want to see? And I feel like it's a broken record at this point. So, you know, we need to make sure that we're not making the same mistakes. And, you know, when change comes about, um, one, we're educating ourselves and our communities about, you know, what the real issues are and what needs to happen. And then two, implementing those, you know, new policies or systems or what it, whatever it is into our lives and, and then taking the next step to make sure we're not, you know, falling back into this, you know, cycle of injustice and violence again. Um, so, yeah, I encourage everyone to vote and then, you know, just continue to educate yourself, engage in your communities um, and, you know, know that this is a growing process. Nobody's perfect, um, but there's always room to, to grow and get better and keep moving towards that goal. Naz, uh, how do we make sure that this is the end all be all when it comes to change to, uh, to Jared's point? Yes. So, you know, I, I was actually thinking about that. I don't think there ever will, will ever be an end all be all. I think that there will always be something that needs to be improved. And I think that that's one of our starting points of what's next. What's next is to not stop, I would say. Um, you know, as our Twitter timelines become normal, as the voting registration and, and the presidential election is over, we can't stop having these conversations because it's not over. That's not the it all be all. There's still things to be changed in our communities, in our societies, in our world um, that could better our, our lives. So I think that continuing continuing our conversations until we can't speak anymore, I mean, that's, that's our next step and making sure that we're not closing the doors that some of the people before us has opened, like RBG, like Martin Luther King, you know, like so many people who have come before us, we can't stop those conversations. We can't close those doors. So our next steps is to continue, you know, what we're doing right now, continue the Big Ten Coalition, continue our conversations on campuses and, and with our friends, with our parents. I mean, I think that something we didn't touch on is how we can educate, you know, the older generations. They're willing to listen as, as much as how our, our, our friends or our teammates are willing to listen. So continuing conversations, never being satisfied with what's going on. Um, I think those would be our next steps. I mean, most immediate step, go out and vote. Um, but to, to never be complacent or content um, with where we're at and always trying to find um, you know, a way to be better. That's a very, very strong point to end on. By the way, it is November 3rd. It is uh, the 3rd of November, that's a Tuesday. That is election day. Uh, to the points that all three of you have made, everyone make sure you're registered, make sure you do vote. A uh, very strong conversation that we had just, just now right here. You guys should be very proud of the work that you've done so far on the coalition and certainly keep up that good work uh, because this is what's going to help us get to this moment of change. Um, thank you guys for your time. Thank you to watching uh, for watching this uh, with us. And also everybody, as we end, make sure that you wash your hands Put on your mask and keep them on. Let's get through all of this together. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care.